a lot about qPCR in the past in terms of like theoretical. Today, I want to tell you about practical. So we'll actually look at an example of how you can interpret these curves that you get showing the increase in fluorescence as you're making more and more copies of the DNA and how you go from the value, the CQ or the CT value, that value at which that fluorescence actually gets above a threshold that you can measure to a concentration. And so the because what's going to happen in this technique is that each time you make a copy, you're going to be getting an increase in fluorescence. The more copies you start with, the higher that fluorescence is, the quicker that fluorescence is going to go above the threshold that you actually start to be able to detect it. It's above the noise. It's above the threshold of the machine too. And that value is going to be smaller if you have more to start with and larger if you have less to start with. And so basically the CT or the CQ value, the lower it is, the more you had to start with. The higher it is, the less you had to start with. But how much more, how much less? Basically what we can do is we can actually convert the CQ or the CT value to an actual concentration if we have a standard curve of known values to compare to. And so I'll tell you about how we can make that comparison as well as in general, just how we can interpret interpret the curves that we're seeing, some things about setting up your, ex your experiment, um, various practical details. So people have said they wanted more practicals, more actually looking at how we do it. And so here you go. Any type of PCR, whether it's qPCR or normal PCR, it runs in a series of cycles that might, you know, so you might set it up to have, be something like this. Initially, what you have is you have a melt step. At this melt step, what you're going to have is basically a high temperature. This is going to allow the strands to separate to give access to those primers to bind. And so when the primers bind, we call this annealing, and this is going to be a lower temperature so that the molecules aren't just like whizzing all over the place. Because remember, temperature is going to mean that higher temperature, these molecules have more energy and so they can move around more. Lower temperature, they're going to be uh, more able to stay stuck in place. But you don't want it to be too low or else you're going to um, bind non-specifically to things. So you might have to change these different parameters, the different temperatures you use, depending on how specific your probes are and how well they bind and things like that, GC content, all of that good stuff. Once they're bound, now the polymerase can bind there. And then you give it an extension step, you raise the temperature, allow it to extend. So now you're making a copy. Now, after you've made that copy, you're going to detect the fluorescence. And so that's what this little camera is showing here. So we detect the fluorescence and then you do this whole thing again, starting from that melt step, raise it, separate the strands you just made, allow the primers to bind, elongate, do this again and again, typically for like 40 cycles. Then what you might do is you might do a melt curve. So that's what this thing is. Basically with a melt curve, what it does is it's going to start at a lower temperature and then gradually raise the temperature up. Now, as it gradually raises the temperature up, at this point, you haven't done the melting. So you still have double-stranded DNA here. And then the idea is that as you raise the temperature, eventually it's going to get a point to a point where it's going to melt. So when the strands are going to come apart and the temperature at which the strands come apart is going to depend on the like the size of the products and things like how stuck together they are. And so if you have things that are more stuck together, maybe longer, um, maybe more GC, it's going to take longer to it's going to need to get to a higher temperature in order to actually melt apart. And therefore you can tell if things are the same size or if maybe there are different products in the mixture, if you see different like different points at which things melt, then that could be an indication that there are multiple products in there. And so this will be more of an issue when you're doing something um, where you're using just like a cyber green. So one of those um, dyes that just binds to double-stranded DNA. And so as the double-stranded DNA becomes single-stranded DNA, you get less of a signal. And then at a higher temperature, so you're not going to get a signal because the cyber green is only binding to that double-stranded DNA. And so if you do a melt curve like this, you might see something um, that looks like this. Um, so this is basically just showing you the temperature and then the signal. And so you can see you have high signal when you have this double-stranded DNA. Then eventually you get the lower signal when the strands start coming apart because the dye doesn't like to bind to those. And so then you lose your signal. But you can see that some of these are losing their signal faster. It's easier to see if you if you plot the um, like the negative slope 
And so that's what you see here is this is kind of showing you those inflection points. Um, and the peak would be like the inflection point kind of. And what's going to happen is you can see that in some of these samples, you kind of have multiple peaks and then you have things that are that look to be slightly different sizes. So there's, there's various um, caveats about interpreting melt curves, and I'm not going to go too much into that here. Um, but often you do do a melt curve analysis, you can just add it on to the end of your run. Mm -hmm. To make your life easier, you're typically making some sort of a master mix. This might be, you might be starting with a master mix that already has the polymerase and the DNTPs and the salts and all this stuff. If you're using like cyber, a cyber green master mix or something like that, it's already got all of this stuff in here. But you're going to need to add your template and your primers. If you are using the same primers for all your reactions, you just have different templates, then you can actually make a master mix with the primers in there as well. Um, but if not, you can just do all of this separately. I personally hate QPCR because it stresses me out like crazy because you have to pipette these small, small volumes um, into all of these different wells of your, um, of that like 96 well PCR plate and it stresses me out really badly. Um, I like using a multi-channel pipette to help and I kind of plan things out ahead of time, what I'm going to pipette into which wells. Um, and this helps me like stay focused and know what's going where and de-stress a little bit. So here's an example of like a prep sheet that I would make for this, for in this specific example. And note that I'm gonna upload this file to my Google Drive so that you can access it if you want to use it for reference um, or have a better sense of what I'm doing. So this is my goal. I want to have my controls. So I have my water blank and my trisp blank. And then I have my standard curve samples. And then what I have is my different samples that I want to test. And for each of these, I want to do a one to two dilution and a one to four dilution and duplicate. In order to generate the standard curve, what I'm going to do is if I start from the powder, so say if you ordered it from a company and you, um, they deliver it, this dry powder, you want to resuspend it to a stock concentration. It's better to store these at a higher concentration. They'll be more stable. Plus, you, if you were to dilute it all to one micromolar, um, that would, or if you were to leave it all to 1.02 nanomolar, which is where we want to start, that would be a huge, huge, huge um, amount of liquid. So instead, you want to store the stock, and then you can serial dilute the stock out. I like to store these stocks at 100 micromolar, which means that you add 10 microliters of your buffer per nanomol. Um, so I'm using like a um, 10 millimolar tris pH 8, and also use water. Um, then I'm going to dilute that to 1 micromolar. I'm not going to go directly from 100 micromolar to 1.02 nanomolar. That's too big of a jump. And so instead, I do an intermediate. Remember that when you're pipetting a small amount of a highly concentrated liquid, if you have even a tiny bit of less or more than you think, um, that's going to be a really big difference. And so by diluting it in stepwise, you're able to kind of um, buffer out those result, those differences in and therefore have a more accurate number here. So I dilute it to one micromolar, and then I dilute that to my starting concentration, in this case, 1.02 nanomolar. To do that, I'm gonna do two microliters of my one micromolar plus 89.8 microliters of my tris. So what I do is I pipette that in here, mix it up really well, and now I'm gonna do a serial dilution. And by here, I'm preparing this in a PCR strip so that I can use a multi-channel pipette to go directly from here into my QPCR plate. I set up the strip ahead of time to have this tris buffer in here. So once I mix up this sample, I can then take two microliters, mix it up with this, up, down, 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 up, down. You'll find that when you do QPCR, as well as when you do other techniques in the lab, you kind of develop this rhythm and you kind of get this like rhythm going in your head that kind of helps you keep track of things. So speaking of keeping track of things, I did this in a PCR strip. When I'm preparing my samples, I do this either in a PCR in PCR strips or more typically in a PCR prep plate. Um, so by prep plate, I mean, it's just basically another PCR plate, but it's not the one I'm going to use for the measurements. Unless there's enough room on the plate, you can actually do it all in one, but just be careful you're not mixing things up.
well, at least not mixing things up in the sense of confusing the samples, we are going to be mixing samples. More specifically, we're going to be doing a serial dilution. I want to do a 1 to 2 dilution and a 1 to 4 dilution and duplicate. I start by pipetting my samples undiluted into the different wells. And so I'm skipping a column in between so that I have room so I could do a 1 to 2 dilution here and a 1 to 4 dilution here. To get that 1 to 2 dilution, I'm adding my an equal volume of my buffer. So I have 2.5 microliters of my sample. I add 2.5 microliters of my buffer. So give me my 1 to 2 dilution. And then I add tris. We want to add the tris to all of these wells. Basically, that'll give me my 1 to 2 dilution. Then I take um, a portion of that. And I, so then I take like two and a half microliters of that and I dilute it into this well, two and a half microliters with, has the two and a half microliters of tris in it. And now I have a one to four dilution and I have a one to one, uh, one to two dilution. And I have this in duplicate. You can be using a multi-channel pipette to help with this. Um, just make sure you stagger the tips in the pipette. And then you can use that multi-channel to transfer one microliters to your qPCR plate. Be really, really careful when you're using that multi-channel, or even if you're not using a multi-channel, if you're just using a normal pipette, uh, make sure that you're making sure that all of the, you're actually sucking up the liquid when you think it is. One microliter is a really, really small volume. Um, and so you want to make sure that each of those tips in the micro pipette or the multi-channel is pulling up the same amount. Um, and sometimes one of the tips can get jammed or something, and it's not actually sucking up liquid if it's in a bubble or something. Um, and then you your sample is not going to be accurate because you have no sam no template or you have less of the template or maybe you have more of the template or something. You need to make sure they're all even. Now I just need to add the my, my master mix. So it's 19 microliters of master mix to one microliter of my sample. And what I do is I prepare a pipette strip with, with the master mix in there. Um, and then I just have to add this. You want to make sure that in each of this the tubes in your in your PCR strip. Sorry, I was I adjusted this um, example from a past example, which is why there was some typos I'm trying to fix. Um, but basically, you want to make sure you have enough in these wells to do to transfer 19 microliters into each of them. So if you this master mix is typically pretty cheap. Um, so in if you make you want to make a little more than you would normally make for extra for a master mix when you're using a multi-channel, just to make sure you have enough excess so that you can have excess in each of these tubes. So for each of these, it would be like 19 microliters. So if you say 20 microliters and then you have th times three, that'd be 60. So I'd do like 70 microliters into each of these tubes, um, and then 24 into these last ones. Then I can use the multi-channel to transfer this to transfer that master mix into into these wells, mix up and down really nicely. Then I take that to my centrifuge and I do a quick pulse spin um, to spin down um, any bubbles and things like this. Try to get those out oh, after you seal the plate um, with one of those like clear adhesive films, and then it can go straight into the machine and it does its thing, and then it gives us our results. And so now let's look at how we use those results. And so if you look really early, then you're gonna be like, oh my God, did I do something wrong? I don't see any signal. Don't worry, that's what's supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is that in the beginning, you're below the detection limit of the machine. So you need to wait until you actually get um, get above the above the detection level of the device. And so you have every, remember every cycle of the PCR, you're going to be doubling the amount of product that you have. But when you double a really, really tiny amount, it's still a really, really tiny amount. And so later things are gonna be starting when they're doubling, you're gonna be seeing huge increases and it's gonna go really, really fast. You get in this, um, when you're above the baseline, but then you're going to basically run, you're going to be going so fast that you're going to run out of all the ingredients you need. You'll run out of the primer, out of the DNTPs, out of all that other stuff. And so then you start getting in this non-exponential phase where you're not making a copy every time because there's just not enough stuff to do it. And so that's where you're going to see a plateau. And so when you go and you look at your curves, you're going to see something that's kind of S-shaped like this. You start below the threshold of the machine that can be detected. Then you start rising really, really fast. You can see it really, really fast, but then you kind of 
um, plateau out because you run out of all this stuff that you need to keep making copies. And the point at which you get above the threshold, the point at which you get above kind of like the baseline level, the level if you didn't have any of your of the sequence present, that is what we call the CT value or the CQ value. You might see it term different things. And this is going to be basically once you get above that threshold that, and you start to be able to really, really see things go up. So the threshold isn't exactly the same as the detection limit of the device because you're always going to get some noise. And so to account for this, you have negative control, you use negative controls to kind of figure out what that noise is. And so you can include um, like water and, or, and your buffer. You want to make sure too that those things are going to be not contaminated. You didn't accidentally get a little DNA in there. And so those are gonna be good negative controls. If you're trying to then actually quantify things, you're gonna to wanna to have a serial dilution of your, stint, of your positive control. So it's always good to have a positive control if you have one to make sure that, that you can detect something if it's actually there. And if you want to quantify things, then you're going to need to have known concentrations of that thing and not just one concentration, but you need to have a range of concentrations, make a standard curve so that you can compare the signal from your sample to the signal of the known, of the known product to get, to convert from the number of cycles to the actual concentration, because the number of cycles isn't going to really tell you anything on its own. So you're either going to be comparing, doing a relative comparison where you compare it to the number of cycles for another product, or you're going to do an absolute quantification where you're comparing it to a standard. There are a lot of caveats when it comes to doing comparisons between, um, between different products because they, you can have different like efficiencies with the primer binding, with the extension and things like this. Um, and so I'll direct you to some articles if you want to know more about that. And I'm going to talk mostly about quantifying based on a standard curve. So again, that value that we're looking for is that CT value or the CQ value. The more copies you start with, the lower that CQ or CT value is going to be because it means that there was you didn't have to, it didn't take as many cycles for you to get above the baseline to, for you to get above that threshold. And so since it doesn't take as many cycles, you're going to have a lower CQ or CT value. So you can see that the things over here, I had more to start with, and the things over here, I had less to start with. Now, when I talk about more or less, remember that this is referring to the actual sequence being copied and not to the total amount of DNA. If we wanted the total amount of DNA, the concentration of that, this would not be the easiest way to get that. We would just instead go to our nanodrop or go to our spect other spectrophotometer, um, go to a qubit, something like this, and we can measure the total DNA. But that's not going to tell us about how much of the sequence we're interested in is actually there. And so that's why we run qPCR is to look for that specific sequence. And the amount of specific sequence present is going to be what's related to that CQ value. So now let's look at how we can actually convert that CQ value to a to an actual number. So we're going to be doing a standard curve, and I did a post on standard curves the other day. Basically, you start by doing a serial dilution of, of a standard of something of known quantity. And this should be a standard of the product that you're looking for. What you can do is you can actually just order the order the sequence like synthesized, kind of like if you were ordering a primer, but it would be longer. Um, and this would be the product of your, of the PCR, qPCR reaction. It's actually normally not that long anyway. Um, so it's not gonna be very expensive. And you can then order this, the expected product, make a serial dilution of it. And this is going to help you quantify how much of, how much of that product gets made. When you're making the serial um, standard curve, you typically do a serial dilution. So you take a high concentration of it, and then you might do something like quarter it, and then quarter it, and quarter it, or half it, and half it, and half it, depending on what the range you're trying to cover is. The thing with the serial dilution is you want to always make sure that you're in the linear range. If I had gone to too high of a concentration, I would have seen that this wouldn't be linear. It wouldn't be, it would start like curving. 
And if I went to too low a concentration, then it would be kind of like below the detection. So it would be like kind of saturating the machine and then not detectable by the machine. And so you want to use the region that's actually linear. So there's a direct linear relationship between the CQ or the CT and the concentration. Now here I'm graphing the log concentration because this is going to make it easier to easier to read things and interpret, um, especially because we've done the serial dilution. It's just changing the scale so that it actually looks like a line. Um, and But this means that our data is going to then give us, when we go directly from the CQ, we're going to get the log concentration. And then we're going to calculate, we're going to then convert the log concentration to the actual concentration. And I'll get into how we do this. But the thing is that you need to make sure that you're only going to use data in this linear range. And, and then that you're actually going, your data is going to fall within that range as well. So just like the standard curve, wouldn't it be accurate if you were at really high concentrations where the machine can't detect differences or really low differences where the machine can't detect anything, your sample, this is the same way. And so you need to make sure that your sample is going to be in that detectable region and that is going to be in the region that's covered by your standard curve. So for example, in this sample, I didn't have, I had a too low of a concentration. And so I want to be able to quantify these things based on my standard curve, which is over here, because these things are way, way lower than the standard curve. So you can see they take a lot more cycles. And this is going to mean that they're not going to be usable. Um, or mean like they're not going to be able to quantify it based on the standard curve. So now let's look at how we actually go from this to actual concentrations. So when you when the run is over, you're going to be able to export the data. And when you export the data, you'll have an option for it to export the like the CQ values. You can also set things up more on the actual machine. So it'll do some of this for you. Um, but I just export the values and do it in Excel. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a standard curve. I'm going to find the equation of the standard curve. So I'm going to do a linear regression. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use that equation to figure out the concentration of my unknown. So my A, my B, and my C. What I have over here is you see I have my negative controls, I have my water, and I have my tris, so my buffer. Then this curve, this is going to be my standard curve. I've done a one to four serial dilution of this standard curve. Here I only have one replicate, but if you, with this example, but then I started doing two, um, it's better to have um, better data. Make sure, especially if you, one of the points is a little off, you want to have a backup. Um, and so then you can just average the values that you get from those curves. For each of my samples, I do have duplicates. Um, and I also have two dilutions. So remember, you want to make sure that your sample is going to be within the range that's covered by your standard curve. I had an idea of how much DNA of the template that was in there that would be able to, so I knew kind of like how much I would probably need to dilute. And so then I just did a one to two and a one to four dilution. Now, if you have a lot more present to begin with, you're gonna need to do a bigger dilution. If you don't have much present, you might not even be able to dilute at all if you want to get within the range of your standard curve. We're going to use tell how we actually go about making this standard curve. Basically what I have graphed out here, this is the concentration that I know because these are my standards. This is the CQ. Remember, this is also called the CT. This is the value that I'm getting from the machine. It's actually going to give you this value with like these crazy long number of digits, which it cannot measure that really that that accuracy accurately. Um, and you can't probably pet to that many digits. Basically, that's way too many sig figs. Um, much more in sig figs in another post. Um, but if you have if you're in an Excel and it has like a bazillion digits, um, you can just go over here and reduce those. And now I'm going to use those CQ values to actually make my standard curve. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be graphing the log 10 of the picomolar. Um, and so basically what this is going to do is it's just going to change the scaling of the axis 
axis of the y axis so that it's actually going to look like a line. And so basically, if you have, if you're doing these divisions where you're going to have a large range of of these values, like four to a thousand, if I were to plot four to a thousand, the four and the 16 and the 64 would all get like squished down here. And then you have 250 and then you have a thousand up here. Um, and so your data would be really, really squished down here and really then the other would be like, it would look like an outlier and you couldn't really tell what was going on. So we can take the log of that and then this is going to make it so that we can actually interpret the results. But when we do this, this means that the equation that we get from this line is going to be giving us values in terms of the log 10 of the picomolar. And so then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to actually convert it by taking the inverse log 10. So basically 10 to the calculated log 10. In order to actually just get the standard curve and get that equation, you can just come and you can copy your data. I mean, select your data, then insert a scatter plot. So right now it's actually graphing the axes, not the way I want. So I will just select this, select the data, um, and then drag this boxes. So it's actually going to be doing this the way I want. There we go. Okay. And now what it can do is you just come over here and then you can right click, add trend line. We just want a simple linear regression. This will do the trick in order to actually see it. We can display the equation on the chart and display the RQ value, R squared value. And that's going to give you an indication of how well the data, the line fits your data. Um, and you want it to be closer to one. More on this in my standard curve post, but you want you there are ways to be fooled by a bad R, by a high RQ value, R squared value, sorry. And so you always want to look at the plot. If you have, remember, you only want the linear range. So if you have sample rings at the ends that are kind of like way off, you're not going to want to include those in the values that you use to determine your trend line. But in this case, they all look pretty OK. And so I get this equation. And so the slope of this equation is here, and the, and the intercept is here. And basically why I care about those is because I can then get an equation that I can plug in to convert the CQ, so the cycle, that cycle number that you get above the threshold to the concentration of my standard. And if I know it for my standard, then I can actually apply it, that equation, to get the concentrations of the things that I don't know. So the things that I don't know, I can then apply the same formula in order to figure out their concentration. So to get the concentration, what I'm doing here is I'm multiplying the CQ value I got by the slope and then plus the intercept. And this is going to give me the value I want. And I can just then, once I make this equation, I can just then, you can just drag it down all of these and it's going to apply this to all the samples. Now, remember that this is going to be the log concentration. And so in order to actually get the concentration directly, what we want to do is we want to take the inverse log. And so we're going to go 10 to the power of that concentrated calculate, the concentration in the log form. And then we have to take into account our dilution factor. So remember that we diluted these samples before we actually measured them. And so the original stock of the sample is going to be a higher concentration. If we did a one to two dilution, then our original sample is going to be twice as concentrated as that sample that we measure. If we did a one to four dilution, well, now we're going to have four times as much. And so the dilution factor is going to be what you're going to be putting in here. If you had, say, a 1 to 10 dilution, that would be a 10. But in my cases, I have a 2 and a 4. So in order to get the stock concentration, I'm just going to multiply the picomolar that I get, the concentration that I calculated for my diluted sample, times the dilution factor. And this is going to give me my stock concentration. So you only want to use a sample, only trust the value if it's within the value range of your standard curve. So you can see that my standard curve covers 6 to about 6.4 to 14.9. And all of these values are going to be within that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to average together all of the values because they're all within the range. Um, and so I average together these values from my different duplicates and from the different dilution factors. And I can get the average concentration. And so you can see that this one was a lot more concentrated than these two samples.
And by concentration, remember, we're talking about the concentration of that specific sequence, not the concentration of the overall DNA. So to review, with qPCR, as well as with just like normal qPCR, you're running a bunch of cycles, and each cycle you're making a copy of a specific region of DNA. The more copies that you start with of that template that you're making copies of, the more copies that you're going to, the sooner you're going to make a lot, a lot, a lot of copies because you're make, doubling the amount of copies every time. And just like one times one is really small and two times two is really small. When you get to like 20 times 20, then you start jumping up really quick. And so when you do a PCR, if you were to measure the copies as they get made, you're going to see some sort of S shape like this where you start where you below the level of detection and then you're kind of just below the level of noise but then you start seeing a huge increase in your copy number and then you start running out of running out of the ingredients that you need to make copies so you get this s-shaped curve and there's this point where you cross the threshold and you start to be able to really see these copies get made if you can measure them, remember. And so in normal PCR, you're not measuring the copies as they're being made. But in real-time in real-time PCR, you are. You're using fluorescence, such as like fluorescent probes or double-stranded DNA binding dye that's going to give you a readout of these copies as they're getting made. And so what you see is that you're going to get to a point where you see that the signal is going, that fluorescent signal telling you about how many copies there are is going to reach a threshold that's above just the background fluorescence. And this is going to be a value we call the CT or the CQ value. The more copies you start with, the lower that CQ or CT value is going to be. And the, the, the fewer copies you start with, the more cycles it's going to take, the higher the CT or CQ in order to get past that threshold. We can actually, if we know how to convert the CQ to the, C, um, to the concentration, then we can figure out the actual concentration, the absolute concentration. But in order to do this, we need to make a standard curve where we take the product that we're expecting of a known concentration and dilute it to a serial dilution so we get a range of quantities of known value. And then we can compare the CT value we get or the CQ value we get to that of the standard. And therefore, we're able to calculate the concentration of our, of our sample. And when we're talking about the concentration, we're not just talking about the total DNA. We're talking about the actual sequence that was present. So hope that helps you understand how to interpret qPCR data.